There we go. Well, hello, Great. everybody. Don't and... get started. Perfect. So hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our, our March call. Uh, this is kind of the, the highest frequency we've had these calls um, so far with our last one in December, but we're trying to do them quarterly just so everybody can keep up with all the, the fun stuff that's that's happening in Guatemala and now El Salvador. And also just a chance to like really have more spaces to, to kind of engage. Um, so this is a really exciting time for us. Planting is coming up in May. Uh, and this is kind of like our scurrying to get everything done before farmers, you know, make their big decision about which seed they're going to be utilizing. And so there's a lot of stuff happening, but I think the, the really good thing about the timing of this call is we can kind of follow up on some of the stuff that we talked about in December. Um, so in December, we were at a big turning point, looking at launching in our second country, doing a lot of fundraising to make that happen and looking at launching the first seed that Simeon Nueva has developed in-house. I think we have some really exciting updates on all of those fronts. And so I'm gonna share my screen and just kind of give everybody like the quick overview of the things we're looking at talking about in this call. And so there's a little bit of a 2022 recap now that we actually have some of our impact data back and actually um, you know, put all the final numbers together in terms of the families we reached, the incomes that we were able to increase, the impacts on nutrition and the studies that we're doing with, with universities to look at those impacts. Um, and I definitely wanna dive more into F7, our newest seed and kind of the, the new data that we have on that, as well as talk about those expansions to El Salvador and work with the Guatemalan government um, and how that kind of more policy lens is going. And, and we'll finish up with questions and answers, which is, as always, my, my favorite part of these calls. Um, so without further ado, I, I wanted to start off with kind of like a quick overview of what Simeon Weba does. Milago, uh, which is one of our, our favorite foundations, um, favorite supporters and thought partners, helped us come up with a presentation that we shared with a lot of peers in their network. And they're able to help us get kind of like the big picture of why we do what we do down to just one slide, which I thought was fantastic. And so I kind of wanted to share that because I think from a systems perspective, it gives a good overview of what we see as the problem and what we see as the solution that Simeon Nueva can offer. The problem is that everyone needs maize. I mean, 1.2 billion people around the world. Soon it's going to be 2 billion people around the world. Um, most of the folks that are going to be in countries with high rates of malnutrition by, say, 2050 are going to be in countries that predominantly eat maize. And maize is just unfortunately not a highly nutritious crop. And the yields that most farmers are getting are really low. One of the big problems behind that is that farmers can't afford good seeds. There's fantastic seeds coming out every year, um, open source stuff that any local seed company can utilize, uh, as well as really good genetics coming from the big seed companies. But farmers, for the most part, can't afford those really good new seeds. And on top of that, we have an issue with nutrition where there are genetics, there's approaches to make corn a highly nutritious crop, but most farmers aren't willing to pay more for a more nutritious corn seed. On top of that, there's an issue from the supply side. So small seed companies exist in Guatemala, and Honduras, and El Salvador, and Kenya, and Malawi, in the countries that we are the most focused in, in terms of high poverty rates and really high rates of malnutrition. But unfortunately, those seed companies can't make enough more money launching these new high yield seeds to justify them doing all of the work to train farmers on them, to teach them about them, and to switch out from their older seeds to these newer ones. And what that means is, if we want to look at that from a more systems approach, we need to think about solutions that can work not just in Guatemala, but in a lot of other countries. And that's where the first piece of the solution really comes down to science. We can develop seeds that have both high amounts of nutrition, as well as high yields, and more uh, adaptability to climate impacts, droughts and floods that are big drivers behind migration and, and food crises around the world. What we need to do, though, is make sure that farmers can actually afford those seeds and make sure that seed companies will actually make more money selling those seeds. If we can fix those three problems, 
we have a chance to make a big difference for the 1.2 billion people and the 53 million farmers that depend on corn in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central America. So Samin Weba started off, you know, like five years ago, we, we figured, how can we do this? How can we learn how to make this work? And we started a model that was about proving that if you took really high yielding nutritious seeds and you sold them at a good price, farmers would buy them. And we got great results. And that gave us the insights, the, the tools to start pivoting, which we began in 2020, into a more comprehensive approach, which works on converting seeds and developing seeds that are, that are highly nutritious and high yielding, and then testing, designing, and, and advocating for subsidies that could actually help seed companies to sell them at the right price for farmers to be able to afford. And then work on getting those subsidies turned into loss that they can be there in the long run. And Simia Nueva doesn't have to be the primary driver of this process. This takes us into the results from last year. And I think in terms of all the years we've been working, it's the year that I'm the most proud of. We saw a massive increase in the amount of farmers that were using our seeds. So there's 20,000 farmers, or sorry, that are using our seeds out of a million total farmers. That's 2% of the farmers in Guatemala are now using a higher yielding biofortified seed thanks to this approach of us selling, but also supporting other local seed companies to sell. In terms of what that's done for farmers, it's led to a huge increase in yield. Uh, we had some preliminary data back in December. Now we're in March, we've been able to crunch all of the numbers. And what we saw is that on average, farmers increased their yields by 41%. And what that led to is an 88% increase in profit on average for the average farmer using our seeds last year. Um, from $211 to $396. Now, this is a insanely low amount of money, but when you keep in mind that in Guatemala, it takes about $20 a month to put a kid through high school, it's a huge impact. And that's what we're kind of after. How do we come up with a tool that helps farmers to reach the livelihoods goals, the economic goals that they have, but just happens to have the nutrition that they need? On the climate side, I know I, I showed this photo back in December. It's my favorite one from all of last year, but it, it shows Guatemala's most common commercial seed um, and our seed and how those two seeds respond in moments of big storms. And what you can see is that with breeding, you can actually develop seeds that can withstand those, those really big problems. Um, and so what that's meant for us is for the 74% of farmers in Guatemala, you know, the, the farmers we supported, who experienced storms or droughts, which is an insanely high number. Um, for storms, farmers were able to cut the loss that they had during those big events by almost half. So there were half as many plants that were blown over, that rotted, as were happening with their, their traditional seeds, whether those were commercial or, or the local seeds they've been replanting for a long time. And in droughts, it's a little bit more modest, uh, but we're also seeing like a really big increase to, in terms of decreasing rot uh, during drought, which is one of the primary ways that, that stuff gets lost and, and improving yield. And with the new seeds that we're launching, this is gonna get even better. Um, one of our biggest funders is very interested in climate resilience. And they always ask us, you know, are you breeding for climate? And the answer we have to say is that there's no way to help farmers make more money without developing seeds that are climate resistant, because that's one of the big primary problems that they're dealing with. In terms of nutrition, stuff is going really, really well. We have a big study with Cornell, looking at some of the most innovative new ways to be able to determine what's going on in people's bodies with zinc, which is the, the biggest nutritional deficiency in Guatemala. Um, and so they're, they've been able to find a new way to look at somebody's blood and figure out from that how much things do they have in their body? How much is available for them on a daily basis? And that has been massive. And so we just finished our kind of second measurement in that study. Half the farmers have our seed, half of them have normal seeds. And we're gonna be working on the second big set of measurements over the coming six months. And at the same time, we're looking at working with the US government and a couple other funders and, and actually building a much bigger study to be able to show how well you know, not just in terms of nutritional intake, but in terms of the biological status of children and women, we can make a big difference in terms of um, those gaps in nutrition. 
And lastly, uh, we're working with UC Davis on being able to do better modeling. So right now we don't have the best models to be able to predict how much nutrition kids are actually absorbing from the foods that they're eating. UC Davis has come up with some great ways to fix that. And we're working on kind of connecting those new models with the data that we're actually getting from, you know, kids and women in the, in the previous studies. And we'll be able to predict to a much better extent the, the impact that we're having on those vulnerable populations just from switching from one type of corn to the next. Breeding has also been huge. Um, one of the things we're most excited about is we actually just entered into our first alliance with a large seed company. Uh, Bayer is one of the, the best in the world, and they'll be working with us to actually identify where the genes are that cause a corn seed to be more nutritious. And then working on using that information to be able to speed up how quickly we can develop um, seeds that have higher levels of nutrition. It's important to note, and I think we always do in every one of our calls, that our seeds are not uh, GMO. We have nothing against good use of, of GM technology, but in most of the countries where we work and where we foresee ourselves wanting to work, uh, GM technology isn't really allowed. And so all of this is about how can you speed up the process just using kind of the good old fashioned way of, of you know, making one corn plant have babies with another corn plant and get to the best new corn seed that has even higher levels of, of nutrition. The other thing we're super excited about is our first seed. We've been investing a massive amount of our resources, a huge portion into developing better and better seeds for farmers. And the first one that's resulting from our own breeding is launching in the market over the next 30 days. Uh, so we're hoping to get about 2,000 backs, which will reach about 4,000 families in 2023. Uh, it'll be us and two other seed companies that are gonna be launching that seed. The El Salvadoran government is also testing it so they can start using it in their own programs. And I think the cool things that we've got since the last time we shared this call in our updates is what we're seeing is a lot more resistance to diseases. Um, including tar spot, which is one of the biggest diseases in Guatemala, um, and also a lot faster growing cycle. And so it looks like this seed may actually be the, the shortest cycle, the quickest to grow in the seed market right now, which for farmers that are struggling with droughts and storms is a huge deal because the shorter the window, um, the less likely you are to get hit by a drought during the growing cycle. And secondly, there's this kind of rush during harvesting for, for farmers to sell as quick as possible. Um, the difference in two weeks in terms of your harvest can make a difference of 30% in your profits. And so again, this is kind of like listening to farmers, listening to what they're most interested in and trying to develop a seed that combines those higher yields and that nutrition with those needs. In terms of yields, uh, we're about five to 10% higher than our previously best seed, the one that we launched last year at about 10% below the best seed on the market from Monsanto Bayer. In terms of working with the government, that's also been going really, really well. Government and other seed companies, uh, this year, 5% of all the seed being sold is going to be sold by other seed companies using our subsidy mechanism. And what we're seeing is a lot of the customers that are buying this are farmers that normally couldn't afford seed. And subsidies made the seed cheap enough we're talking, you know, 40 something dollars per bag of seed that for the average farmer who buys maybe half a bag, that's actually affordable. If you compare $40 a bag to say $160 for the more expensive seed from international seed companies, you can start to see why that kind of question of affordability is, is so important, especially for farmers that are only making $200 uh, a year in profit. We're also working with the Guatemalan government to get some funds to kind of start actually uh, scaling this up in the government. And I think the big math is is as follows. You know, um, if the government spent $4 million a year, it would lead to about $40 million in increased income for farmers, a quarter million families that are going to have uh, better nutrition, and those families selling enough grain into the market to cut the nutritional deficiencies of the national population roughly in half. And so I think it's at a good spot where we don't have it nailed down perfectly yet, but there's a lot of iteration with the seed companies to figure out how to make it work and really good initial dialogues for the government in terms of how to actually make it into a long-term program. 
And lastly, we're super excited. We're, Guatemala doesn't have a program to help uh, small farmers get access to seed. The El Salvadoran government, you know, right to our south does. And they're looking for new seeds right now to include into that program. And Simeon Nueva is right in there. So we'll be doing about 20 experimental tests with them throughout the country, including tests with their seed companies to produce the seed and sell directly to the government this year, which I think is just a, a fantastic initial step. We also brought on two really great new members onto our board of directors. So Dr. Elsa Morano was a uh, Subsecretary uh, for, I think I would say, food safety um, for the USDA, which is amazing to have somebody of that caliber. She runs the, the Borlaug Institute, um, which is one of the biggest centers doing research into how to best reach small farmers. Um, just a fantastic person to be, to be guiding us. And Marisa um, is a Guatemalan lawyer trained in both Guatemalan and U.S. law and our first lawyer on the board, which is awesome to have someone who is from Guatemala, knows law in both countries. And she actually runs a law firm uh, specialized in helping get things done with the Guatemalan government, which I think is fantastic. And so, you know, for us, so much of what we do depends on really strategic advice from top level folks on our board. Um, you know, we've got Ray in the call right now, who's been one of the most important people for advising us. And so it's really amazing to start having, um, you know, new people who can bring a whole new set of skills to the board of directors. I wanted to kind of end looking at a couple, just what this all has felt like on the ground, you know, what we were able to accomplish. Um, and also just give a little bit of more of a, a human look at the work. Our team is up there on the top, being able to see kind of like all of the faces of the folks who are working on this day in, day out. On the top left for the big nutrition study that we did, we actually, our field technicians over Christmas, it was like the day before Christmas, were driving like big bags of corn to the families um, that are part of the study. You can see one of the families that we worked with in the top right and the top left, or in the bottom left, um, as well as come with some of the folks uh, photos of, of the seed actually in the ground with our team. 2023 really is, I think, our biggest year for ever. Um, we've received some huge support from the foundations that support us, some new foundations uh, which are starting to support us. We actually just two days ago got our first two subcontracts from the USDA uh, to test our new seeds and also do some, some work on the nutrition side uh, for seeing human impact. Rotary has been a huge partner in helping us to continue growing in some of the regions that are the, the most marginalized and the toughest to reach. And we've also seen a huge amount of, of impact from the individual donors who've come to our events in, in Boise, in Minneapolis, the online event we held at the end of the year, et cetera. And what that's made possible is, is a big expansion. So from 20,000 families last year, we're looking at 32,000 families this year. El Salvador this year, Honduras, the following developing seeds for Africa, working on actually building a sustainable way to keep all this work going in Guatemala without us. Partnerships with the big seed companies and working with some of the world's best universities to actually measure impact and get peer-reviewed journal articles and publications on how well it's working and the things that we can do better. It's going to lead us to hiring a new PhD breeder, a hopefully PhD in either um, agricultural economics or nutrition to run kind of our impact assessments, and a whole team with some help from Marisa on our board, working with the Guatemalan government and now the El Salvadoran government. And as always, I mean, all of this work kind of depends on our staff. It depends on a team that is out there every single day with farmers. And to give you all a sense of kind of where we are and, and how we're going to make possible that big expansion, in our field days last year, by March 30th, we had just under 400 families who had come to an event and learned from one of their community members how well the seed had worked for them. This year, we're at over 1,300 farmers educated just within the first quarter. And we have big plans to keep that rate going over the course of the year. And so it's just, to me, super inspirational to see kind of 
not only you know at the top end the the breeding work etc but also just on the ground with the farmers seeing how happy they are with the newer seeds that we're launching um, and how well that's doing given all of the challenges they're facing with climate the price of fertilizers from the conflict in ukraine etc and so with that you know i'll kind of uh stop off. I think this might be a quicker call considering that we're doing them quarterly now and just say thank you to everybody who made it and and just open it up for for questions and answers. So feel free to write something in the chat. Gabby's going to be uh, keeping track of all of those or just um, unmute, but really excited to, to hear what you guys think, anything you might be curious about or any suggestions for how we could do better in the future. Just a second, we have uh... Howdy, Glenn. We can hear you. Oh, you're on mute. Now you're on mute. David Smith said you had received some large amount of funds from, I'm not sure what the source of the funds were, but it had a, had a lot of digits in the number. It did, yeah. We, we received a, a $1.5 million one-time grant from a organization called RippleWorks based out of the Bay. And so that is a huge reason why a lot of this, this growth and expansion is possible. Uh, why we're being able to hire a top-notch international plant breeder, uh, a great person for impact, and secure a lot of funding for kind of 2024 as well. And so most of that money, we're burning a small amount of it over 2023. Most of it we're putting towards 2024 and a small amount is going into our emergency reserves. But it's a, it's an incredible opportunity um, and we're just so excited. It's a lot of growth too. Uh, I think what's dangerous about a one-time donation is it's, you know, you got to make sure that you don't invest in the wrong things and not have, you know, funding set up in the future to, to cover whoever you hire, et cetera. And so that's kind of why we're trying to use it in a, in a very thoughtful and slow manner. Um, and there's a lot of conversations with the board about how to do that. And I think we have a pretty good plan. But again, focusing on coming up with much better seeds, folks. Because once governments take this program on, we don't have to pay for the cost anymore, and we can focus on on new places. So, how many how many more gifts are you expecting? From this organization, they only do it once. That's their deal. One time, big check, which yeah. is a mixed blessing. No, it's all the other organizations you know, over the last ten years that have. Uh provided you some assistance and have they uh, stayed on board? Yeah, I think almost every single one of our major funders in terms of foundations over the last five years has pretty much grown significantly at one point or another and is still with us. Um, Milago has been one of the biggest champions for us. They you know, brought us into their fellowship program back in 2017 and have recommended us to a lot of people uh, VTOL, David Weekly, which is now called Dovetail Foundation, Cartier, uh, there's a lot of good folks. And I think as they're seeing the, the scope of this increase, they're really interested in helping us get to that next level. Because I think that's what's, what's so cool about all of this is as we get better, as we come up with better seeds, as we get more efficient at getting those better seeds to farmers by working with other companies and as we make it more sustainable with the, the governments, the kind of conversion rate of a dollar in leading to how much impact gets better and better. So it used to take us $2 of donations to help a farmer increase their income by a dollar. Last year, it was like a dollar of donations helped us increase uh, uh, about a dollar 30 for each farmer we supported. And we're hoping to continue increasing that this year. So like on top of the nutritional benefits, we're just getting more and more efficient at providing value um, and impact on the ground. And I think a lot of people see that and like, that's great. Let's keep this going. Let's make it even more efficient. I mean, my dream would be for every dollar that we raise, 
a poor farmer makes five dollars extra and feeds their family and helps improve the nutrition of all the folks in their country that would just be incredible and that's where i want us to go well you're heading in that direction are you not we are <laughs> we definitely are yeah and i mean it's taken us a long time but i think we've kind of been really really focused since the very beginning on that idea of efficiency of scale and impact and you've been a big piece of it i mean i was just uh just on the farm last thursday and friday walking around and seeing all the test sites that are that are covered with uh the irrigation system that y'all put in and sitting on the deck that you guys helped build and i mean it's it's incredible to see how it's grown since um, y'all were there last. Yep. Well, I'd like to get down there again sometime. Let me, let us know. Uh, we'll we will write that down and follow you up with it because uh, we'd love to have you. Yep. Richard, you got your hand up. You can just you can just unmute and shout out. It's kind of a you know very liberal open classroom here. The uh, UC Davis and Cornell studies are very exciting. Um, now they are comparing users of your seed to users of other seeds. It's not just the nutritional benefits of these these biofortified seeds. Yeah, so we have a group of families that planted normal corn and a group of families that planted our seed, and they harvested it, they're eating it, and we started kind of looking at blood and fecal uh, samples for young women and kids under two in both groups, both before they started eating it and now while they're eating it. Um, and what's super interesting there is there's this scientist, uh, Dr. Elad Taco at Cornell, and we had this huge problem in the nutrition world for a long time where you could take someone's blood and you could look at how much zinc was in the blood, but you wouldn't be able to tell if it was low because they were sick or because they weren't eating enough zinc. Um, inflammation created kind of false positives. And so he found an amino acid ratio that actually cuts through that noise and tells you the actual biological status of the people. This is brand new. Um, the first study in the world that is looking at multiple groups getting the same diet and looking at the results for all of it is actually this study in Guatemala with us, which is super awesome. Um, and he's also really interested in gut microbiome, just kind of how uh, the majority of cells in a human body are not human cells or other stuff. It's doing a whole bunch of things. And depending on what those cells are, uh, a lot of stuff can happen, you know, depression, disease, et cetera. And so he wants to see how nutrition levels, um, especially, specifically like zinc intake, if you get enough zinc, how does it change that microbiome? And, and can you predict other sources of impact from that? And so it's it's really cool to be to be working on that, even though it does mean we are collecting, you know, uh, poo and sending it to New York, which I think is funny in its own way. And when do you expect to have some results? One thing that's been very frustrating with me and for me and my work in Galapagos is how long it, it takes to get results that uh, universities are comfortable really making public. Um, are you going to be getting information soon? Do you have preliminary results that you can share with us, or is it uh, going to be a while before we we hear? It's going to be a bit. Um, so I think we will start. We'll have the last bit of data collected in the fall. And then universities can take a little bit to actually go through all that data and get it in a possible form, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're hoping to have some good preliminary stuff by beginning of next year. And um, I was just on the phone with both the PIs, the principal investigators uh, from Guatemala and from Cornell yesterday, and are actually hoping to present some preliminary findings at the micronutrient uh, forum in The mm -hmm. Hague uh in the fall so okay. that'll be fun those results are positive it's going to be a, a game changer i think in your ability to convince governments and others to to move forward so excellent i think it's yeah i think it's gonna be super important it's i mean it's a small preliminary study and i think we've tried to frame it that way to everybody this is not the one study that tells everything because it's, it's an innovative new way of looking at uh these issues 
And so I think what we're hoping is this data can help us do a much bigger and more statistically powerful study, uh, probably in 2024. Mm -hmm. And we're actually in talks with USAID uh, about that right now. So that's another one of the, the things that we're working on. Perfect. Mateo, you, uh, you got some questions on white corn tasting bland and F7's lysine. Do you want me to read them out? Do you want to you want to voice them yourself? Oh, you're on mute. You are on mute, but I will, I'll, I'll read them. Yeah, because we can't hear you, unfortunately. Sorry. There, there, we, there we go. Guatemalan, I, I spend, I take two trips a year. I spend four months of my life in San Juan La Laguna. Last yep. year, um, Federico Fiallos, was kind enough to send us a sack of 20 kilos of F3. I left before the harvest. I have sent pictures to uh, Gioni Tuck. Okay. And the harvest looks really good. You might ask her for that file of those pictures. You know, we're I'm writing her right now. That's super exciting. Okay. No, they're, they're doing really well. And but I also br have brought a seed in for several years. I, I'm trying to start a seed cooperative there. I, I work with the Petaluma Seed Bank in Southern Sonoma County. They market Baker Creek Seed Company products, heirloom vegetable seeds. So I've been doing that for years and I smuggled them in, of course, but um, they're all USDA approved and in sealed envelopes. But I've added this last year, uh, you, your organization was generous enough to donate 20 kilos. It's been very popular. That's awesome. But I'm still by, I prefer yellow corn. Now I brought in a corn seed years ago from Baker Creek Seed Company, which is orange. It's from New Mexico. Yeah. I felt rather embarrassed to do it. I felt sort of arrogant to bring to the Mayans the people who invented corn seed. I, I didn't know how they'd take it, but they kept asking me for more. And it's it's an heirloom seed and they keep distributing it. It's very popular there now and people are selling it. It's very flavorful. I assume it has a lot of, um, I assume it has more nutrition in various ways. Uh, carotene, for example, because it is almost orange. And people I know, gringos there, jubilados, who've, you know, settled around the lake, they prefer orange corn. So is there any effort to what, I'm going to have to try the product when I go back. The harvest is in from Semilla Nueva in San Juan, and I'll, I'll taste test, but I'm rather biased against white corn. Not just my... Not just Maseca, mind you, but the tortillas in the Pueblo are flavorless. They're almost like building material. In the yeah, time. yeah, no, and I think a lot of the corn uh, in Lake Atitlan is normally, you know, they call it like maíz de la costa, the kind of like commercial grain that's like produced in the lower tropical areas and and sold up there, and you know. You, I, I'm excited to hear how people react to the taste. Uh, when we've done blind taste tests, everybody has, I think over 90% of people have always preferred the tortillas made from the high protein quality maize, like ours, like F3, F5, over native corn, native white, uh, the, the white that's white maize that's coming from commercial seeds, et cetera. It's softer, it gets hard, you know, over a much longer time. So people, so women can actually make the tortillas in the morning and they last all day, which is like great. Um, there's a lot of benefits. And I think it'll be really cool to, to hear what people there think. Because I think that's one of the special things about Guatemala is there's so many cultures that have so many preferences that you can't just say, this is the Guatemalan favorite because there's so many little Guatemalas. Um, I, one of the things I'm really interested in and I think this is going to be uh, a priority for us in the future um, and something I'm hoping we can start doing some fundraising for to, to make happen is developing um, especially blue, um, blue maize. 
And so there's all of this research research that's going on right now about um, anthocyanins and, and polyphenols in blue maize. Basically the blue maize, like the blue corn tortilla chips, I actually have some on the counter over there because I, oh, I love them. Um, yeah, it has the same amount of antioxidants as like blueberries, which is bonkers to be able to get like, for farmers that are eating a pound of corn a day, to basically have the same amount of antioxidants as a pound of blueberries a day would just be huge. And we're learning more and more about how that affects uh, the, the gut microbiome and how that affects nutritional availability of the nutrients farmers actually get. And so I, this is a huge area that we want to get into. Um, orange maize, I think, is normally really good for vitamin A. Unfortunately, in Guatemala, well, not fortunately for in Guatemala, there's almost no deficiency of vitamin A because it's in all the sugar. And as you probably know well, people eat a decent amount of sugar. And so there's like no vitamin A deficiency. So we're not we're not going to prioritize that. Um, but the blue stuff looks fantastic. Um, and farmers can actually sell it for more. There is a market for blue maize. And blue maize right. is more expensive than white maize. And there's no commercial blue maize seeds. So there's a lot of wins there. And I think what we have to do before anything um, you know, we've started some very, very artisanal projects on our farm where we're like, we've taken some native blue seeds and started to try to bring that blue into our F5 and F7. Uh, but it'd be looking at all the donors out of all the blue maize that's out there, the indigenous stuff from Arizona and New Mexico, the stuff that's in seed banks that's come from Guatemala, commercial stuff in the US, what has the highest nutritional levels? And how can we use that and focus on that um, given that there's so much variability and really come up with something that, you know, has the most human impact. So that's where we want to go. Uh, it's been a pet project or it's been a, a dream of mine. I think everyone from the team and the board who's on the call now knows there's a lot of dreams that come out of my head and like can't do them all. Um, but I'm hoping that we're getting to the point we can start to take that one on because I just think it would be so cool. And the lysine level in comparing F3, which is what my farmers received last year compared with the F5 and the F7? It's pretty much spot on. It's basically the same. Okay. Yep. Zinc levels are pretty much the same. Lysine and tryptophan are basically the same. So, you know, holding the nutritional level and then just increasing yield, increasing disease resistance and shortening the growing cycle are kind of like the big improvements of F7. How many days from planting until harvest with the f7 depends on where you are so in the coast uh we're looking at around 120 and then as you go higher up elevation wise uh you know that extends i think the the seed that most farmers compare it to like the the fastest growing one in the market right now is to 390 uh, which is like a monsanto bayer seed and that's like 123, 124. So it looks like we might be able to shave a couple of days off of that. Um, and F5 and F7 were, were slow. They were some of the, the latest maturing seeds in the market. And so making this big shift is going to be, I think, huge to respond to one of the farmer's biggest complaints in the past. Okay. I'll order some when I get down there in May. We'll send it to you. We'll send it okay. to you. Yeah. I mean, and we'd love to, we'd love to get that information. I actually just sent a message to Gianni and she said, sorry, I forgot to forward it on to you, but I'll do that tonight. So I'll have something to fun to read after the call. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Austin, do you want to shoot your questions out there or should I uh, just read them off? Sure, let me, I don't have the best bandwidth, but I'll turn on my camera. Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Leifers. I am uh, new to Samia Nueva, but uh, I'm a plant breeder and um, have done work in ag development and mostly in Africa and also in the Caribbean, but uh, heard about you all through Accesso, uh, who I'm doing a little consulting for. So um, yeah, I was just curious about the farmers and if they um, typically have cash to buy the seed or if they're using credit. And then I had another question about the um, the checks, but we can do one at a time. Perfect. Yeah. I think most farmers, there's, there's not a good public sector credit system. And I think banking, you can get access to credit. 
but we're, we're talking like 3% monthly interest. Um, and that's if you qualify, if you're willing to put your land up as collateral, et cetera. And so a lot of farmers end up either scrounging money together from friends and family. Um, a lot will borrow or ask for money from their relatives in the States. So this ends up kind of fueling the immigration cycle because the best way to have access to capital in April, May, June, when you're planting and growing is to have family members that can send it from what they've been earning in the US. And if you don't have any of that, um, the going rate for unofficial credit is between five to 10% per month, which is bonkers. Um, and yeah, so that's super tough. And I think that that's one of the big reasons why when you have uh, the, the really good from the transnational companies like, like Bayer or Syngenta or Corteva, um, you know, that cost $160, $170 a bag, farmers see a huge barrier to being able to make that investment. Um, and being able to get our seed down to like $40 a bag, which is even cheaper than the, the cheaper stuff that local seed companies sell and helping local seed companies sell it that cheap has been so good. You know, if the, the average farmer is buying about 20 pounds of seed, about half a bag, it means it's only a $20 investment. And that's so much more accessible. Um, and I think our, our whole hope is how can we help them move from a kind of having this barrier of entering into a commercial market to having kind of that step up. And what a lot of our data has shown is that, you know, most farmers are buying a little bit of fertilizer. They are buying a little bit of herbicides and insecticides. Even the folks growing like traditional Mayan corn, like in the mountains, hillsides, um, who don't speak Spanish as a first language, those folks are also buying fertilizer. And so they're going to little stores. They're like part of this commercial chain. Um, but most of them still aren't growing enough maize to sell. Uh, they're not even growing enough maize to meet for the whole year. And we're seeing even in those conditions, uh, you know, yield increases of 40 plus percent, which can help them move from infra subsistence into actually starting to get commercial and then being able to invest a little bit more the next year. And yeah, we're super excited. We, uh, we visited the Accesso office last week. Um, and so, you know, in El Salvador. And so we're hoping that we can work with them um, as they're providing credit to farmers. Since the seed is so cheap, include it in the packet. Um, I think there's some really exciting opportunities for collaboration there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Quality seed is is an issue everywhere in the world with smallholder farmers. So um, as, as are high interest rates. So, um, okay. And then I just had a second question. I was curious, you mentioned that um, the Semilla Nueva seeds are within about 10% of the, the commercial bear competitor. And is that based on your checks at your trial farm or is that, have you done um, comparisons or trials at, you know, with the Guatemalan farmers? Yeah. So F3 and F5, we have, with F3, we have about five years of data with small farmers who were doing side-by-sides. And that's kind of like our whole M&E system is built on that. So we'll, we'll pay agro dealers to, you know, sell the seed to like give us a list of all the people who bought. And then we'll call through that list and we'll find the farmers who have our seed and then either native seed or the, the sheep hybrids or an expensive Monsanto Bayer seed. And then, we'll find out of all of those who did the exact same fertilizer, same herbicides, same land type, you know, all the things the same and we'll go harvest with them. And having that data for multiple years helps us to kind of like, not just look at the on-farm trials, but actually see real, real farm data. And so F3 and F5, I think we have that rich of data. Uh, F7, not yet. That'll be happening this year. And so, you know, our F7 is kind of based on comparing it to F5 with uh, on on farm trials and also comparing it to F5 in like two years or so of, um, of experimental farm testing. But this will be the year. And sometimes these hybrids surprise us. F5 ended up being way better than we thought. Uh, and I'd, it'd be amazing if we roll the dice and F7 is even better than what our on farm data has shown us. Sure. No, that's great. That's a, a big mistake a lot of people make is to assume that their check data is the same as when the farmers actually planted it in the field. So you all are well ahead of many other projects who have 
done it the wrong way. No, I mean, I, yeah, I think we're just obsessed with it. I think, you know, for me personally, like my first year in Guatemala, I was super into like organic agriculture and we recommended a bunch of stuff we'd read about and seen work in the States and it caused a bunch of farmers to lose money. And I think you only do that once where if you're listening to your conscience, you're like, we will never do that again. And the only way to make sure you're not doing that again is to be super rigorous about, okay, what's going on, not at the experimental farm level, but with the farmers themselves. And let's keep monitoring it every single year to make sure that, you know, we're positive. And where we're negative, where our seed does worse, know why. Like we know that, you know, for the typical farmer who has the money to buy a bear seed, they will make more money with bear. And so now we don't, if a, if a bear farmer, farmer normally buys bear seeds, shows up for our field days, our salespeople don't get to count that as a participant. So it doesn't count towards their KPIs at all um, because we don't want to push them to be selling it in, in, in context where they could be hurting farmers. It's only where it's going to help. Um, and that was a huge shift. You know, you bring a bunch of, of folks who've sold seed their whole lives onto your team and all they want to do is sell seed. Um, and being like, no, we only want you to sell seed. We only want you to promote where you're going to make a positive impact was a really hard shift to change. And we actually ended up letting go about 30% of our ops team uh, as a result, because if they couldn't make that shift, it just wasn't a fit because we're not about sales. Uh, and more and more, we're not even about us being commercially involved at all. It's just helping other seed companies and just making sure the right seed gets to the right farmer to make a positive impact. Great, thank you. Dave, uh, looks like you got a question. You wanna you wanna jump in? Mm -hmm. Beautiful view. Oh, no questions here. Nice. Okay. You, you answered the question I asked earlier. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, okay. I don't know. Does anybody else have anything that they that they're curious about? Anything they'd like to dive into uh, before we close out tonight? How many years ago did you first arrive in Guatemala? You know, you can probably start to count it, Glenn, by the uh, the gray hairs that I'm starting to get all in this this region. But uh, it's been 14 years now. It's been a bit, um, basically the entirety of my twenties and the first half of my thirties are, have been here. Um, I, and I don't know, you know, like, yeah, go for it. I lost a little money cause I didn't think you'd stick with it. Who did you bet? <laughs> ah, that's confidential information. Okay. <laughs> That is fair. Yeah, no, I mean, right now, uh, Glenn, I'm more excited than I've ever been. Um, sure. I think I'm more invested than I've ever been. I've always been like, you know, three to five year time horizon. And I think I'm starting to grow into a time horizon that's a lot longer. Um, you know, we are at one of the most exciting periods, in, probably the most exciting period in human history in terms of what we're able to do with technology and making sure that those advances help the poorest of the poor is something that for a kid who grew up on like Catholic liberation theology and Star Trek, like I get to do the justice stuff and I get to do the cool geeky stuff at the same time. And I just love it. So I, I feel like I'm in my spot. Uh, this is what I want to work on. And, you know, getting to have super nerdy conversations with folks like Ray and the friends he has in terms of what is the latest thing happening with crop genetics and how can we bring that to people who otherwise would never get it? It's just, uh, yeah, I, you know, we're, we have a new board member we were trying to bring on last week. Um, and she was on the, the board of directors of Synod, you know, one of the big organizations we work with and is just a phenomenal plant breeder. And she said, I got interested in all of this breeding stuff because when I first, I was a very young mother and I started raising my kids and I had access to a tiny piece of land and, and you know, just outside of Chicago, like an abandoned lot. And I started, uh, I started gardening on it and I started raising incredible food for my kids. 
And I got to see the impacts that being super well nourished had. And being able to take that, the thing I was able to do for my kids and, and do it for now, hundreds of millions of people is the most rewarding thing ever. And I don't know, just feel the same way. So maybe that can be my my closing comment tonight is to, to say thank you to all of you for being involved. Um, you know, Dave for taking over leadership of the uh, the board of directors, and Adrian for coming to you know a new event um, last Christmas. We are doing some really really great stuff, and I just want to keep going. And I'm just really appreciative, and I know the whole team is really appreciative for for all of you for being involved and uh, helping us make it happen. I'll, I'll place another bet on you. This time, I think you'll make it. <laughs> okay. I'm curious who that that's going to be with and what the wager is. Uh, but sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Well, thank you. You too, Glenn. You too. Best to Marlis. Um, everybody have a wonderful evening. Uh, all the best from Guatemala. And looking forward to seeing you all on, on a call soon or maybe down in Guatemala. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Thank Bert. you all.